every teaching is an expression of Shiva. Every absolutely teaching is an expression of Shiva. Therefore, there are no false teachers. <clears throat> because there are no teachers who teach from their own agency. None. This is the highest level of understanding. This is a tough question. It's a really tough subject. But I need some guidance around it because I, I'll tell you why. Because I'm feeling a, not so much because meditation in the last few days as the question has arisen. You know, of course, I've had so many questions answered in everything you've said and in the, in the meditations. But I want to kind of go, even though I feel like it's resolved in my heart and in a big, big way, I want to bring it out because... The gap in trust, you know, I had to really look, like, where is my, when it first all started to unfold, it was so magical and amazing, I could sort of ignore anything and just be like, this is all going to work out, this is awesome, the place is amazing, <laughs> and if I'm just, uh, you know, high enough in the plane of Shiva, then this will unfold in a way that is going to bounce off anything that comes at me. It's going to, you know, I'm going to ob obtain this special sort of shield of energy or something. So that, that, that like rolled for, for many years and I could lean on this faith in the process unfolding. And yet I have to say over the years, having experiences with, um, I mean, I started calling it, I'm not going to call it this anymore, but just so this is an ethics question. This is this question about integrity, spiritual integrity. Just seeing, you know, the, I started calling it sort of the inevitable deviance of humanity. Like, you know, we see it everywhere. We see it like you were saying, and you've touched on this, and we've touched on this in some of the Q&As. It's, we, we get the politician we deserve, or we, we get, and maybe that translates to we get the experience we deserve. And I get that. I get the reflection. And I'm willing to have the mercy that's required to resolve that. And my heart is opening here. It's being pierced like with a dagger. I saw a vision today in meditation. Shiva piercing me with his dagger and gold coming out. So it's beautiful and wonderful. But like, my question is really, you know, around sort of the threads of undercurrents of like, how can my first Shaktipad experience was with a devotee of Muktananda. It was incredible. It was bizarre. It was wild. Sparkles shooting out of this person's eyes and just inserting a package of information in me. It was unbelievable. And yet that person turned out to be deeply immoral and fraudulent. And I've had to kind of look back on that experience and it's a puzzle to me. And I need kind of help sorting it out on all these levels. Like I want to know the canonical level. And I feel like it's personally resolved but but i i present that as a very broad mm -hmm. topic but i think it's felt every time you you know turn around or i you we could name we could go through all the instances of every it's and it's sexual mi misconduct financial fraud blah 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 so i just want to present this and like i really want to hear your thoughts on it and just really what you think about all that thank you for listening yeah, it's a good, good invitation to really look into this well, without any reservations for ruffling some feathers and also cutting through the biases and debunking things. Let's first establish something here very clearly. And this would also be paying tribute 
to how all the conversation unfolds here under the umbrella of what you have also backed up and encouraging to. So thank you for that. I'm very much in sync and in alignment and resonance that uh, some spiritual traditions should not be sanitized and sterilized and kind of like to present for us Westerners because we cannot be bothered, you know, because we want porridge digested, chewed for us. And I don't know if like smoothie style. No, let's, you know, let's just, yeah. Let's get into it. And it is a technology of consciousness itself. The words, the pronunciation, the sound, the, the namarupa of it, the name and form. So first, before we go into this very, very pertinent, perplexing, bewildering, often, often causing a lot of emotional torment, still causing after many, many years, particularly where there is this trail that is left in large spiritual movements where people consider giving themselves their life, giving themselves their best years and suddenly disillusioned in all this. And I've witnessed that to such a degree that almost like I'm almost immune now to it. You know, it doesn't really affect me anymore. I'll give my perspective on what I'm not affected by. But first I want us to simply have this understanding which Kashmir Shaivism expounds on very, very clearly. Ready? <laughs> there, are, there are false teachings, but there is no false teachers. As paradoxical as this, as this may sound, what does it mean? And we will have to make at least an attempt to reconcile this paradox. If we understood to whatever degree the dynamics of the interaction, that creative tension between subject and object, if we are truly standing on the platform of Advaita, of non-duality, of monism. There is no you and I. There is only awareness. There's only Shiva. Shiva consciousness is all there is. And within that Shiva consciousness, that play of consciousness unfolds for Shiva's own sport. It's horrifying. It is terrifying. And this is where the maturity of spiritual inside begins to rise. Not that it closes our heart, makes us now somehow exempt from experiencing bleeding sense of empathy towards those who are suffering in front of our eyes due to this or that circumstance, whatever. No. But we're holding it simultaneously together simultaneously. It's like, no, I want today's newspaper. I want today's newspaper that still smells of print, that was printed at night, so that I have the freshest, the newest, the cutting edge, what is happening now. Don't give me, oh, now I don't need to worry. I can worry. I can carry it in me. Because I understand the fullness of what is taking place. I understand the full picture. There's no other doer. There's no other agent. None. This, this is the final step in psychological maturity, psychic maturity. And it is accompanied by horrifying realization that everything that is happening in this world in the most horrifying manner is nothing other than my own awareness. So this is like that final, final wisdom of the milk of the tough titi of the mother. Yeah. 
It may taste as it might actually taste as whiskey, you know. To like really to kind of like <laughs> instead of the sweet and you know. So if we understand this, then the teachings within the tradition very clearly speaks that absolutely all, all, what is out there as an attempt to speak to these matters at whatever level, at whatever level, is all an expression of Shiva. Every teaching is an expression of Shiva. Every absolutely teaching is an expression of Shiva. Therefore, there are no false teachers. <clears throat> because there are no teachers who teach from their own agency. None. This is the highest level of understanding. Absolutely everything, the most, be the most com confused, the most, let's say, biased, the most ridiculous, the most, like, really stupid, I don't know, confusing, not taking anywhere, not leading anywhere. It's not coming from anywhere else. <clears throat> this is the golden rule of a thumb with which Kashmir Shaivism operates in as much as that non-dual platform that all these one way or another streams from Shiva and nowhere else. But, of course, soon as we have that understanding, we know that only, only true teaching comes from a place where Shivahood is, has been fully recognized, recognized, lived. So Shiva at the level of Nara, Shiva at the level of individual awareness, is still Shiva. Undiluted, <clears throat> unpolluted, pure in all its attributes, simply in a state of its own self-imposed slumber, in a state of its self-imposed Eclipse. It eclipses its own light from itself and illumines ignorance through light of its own. So in other words, enlightenment and ignorance are lit by the same light. So from that point of understanding, from that point of view, there are no wrong teachings. You see? Every teaching serves whatever purpose. Even if someone needs to be confused, if someone needs to be abused, if someone needs to be derailed, if someone needs to spend another lifetime only to come back and pick up the pieces, all this is cheat villas, all this is play of consciousness. It all happens nowhere else. So we need to really be anchored in this understanding. This is what it means to apply higher means even if we want to still do things at the level where it feels somehow, well, tangible, it makes sense, because at that level where everything is tangible and when everything is, makes sense, is totally written by that, what we spoke earlier, as that sequential mode of perception. And sequential mode of perception is completely and utterly dependent upon subject-object dynamics. So in other words, it's still pretty much applying dualistic perspective, agreeing, concess concession is made. So, uh, from time to time, these attempts are made to shoot at the heart of the target, so that to see whether this, this pierces it. Because when it does, then from that place of highest understanding, this is very interesting now because this is the integral side of this philosophy. From that highest understanding, it becomes very, very obvious how to deal at the level of any of its descents. 
Because then everything that happens at the level of polarity clearly presents it for what it is. Because we established in unity, established in yoga, perform action. Yoga star, Kuru Karmani. When unity is established, action is very, very strong. It's potent and it always takes the side of evolution and flows in the direction of life-affirming qualities. So, this is the first level of understanding whenever we are encountered with whatever level of injustice, whatever abuse, whatever, at, at, at any level. So this is the understanding. This is what sets us free and what expands our consciousness and what also gives us a true impetus to see what is happening at respective levels of creation. So now, once we have that understanding, when, once we have this understanding that everything is an expression of Shiva's will, everything. So then we can, as it were, look for specifics. We can then zoom in into the local picture to see what is happening, what is taking place. And what we see there is that what again here is being performed in the sense of what needs to be delivered, how it needs to be delivered. So what it means is that if there is a certain principle that needs to be employed and that principle will act as that principle of transmission, in our day and age, in our day and age, we cannot expect the standards of, let's say, the sages and the gurus of the past, of the epochs, where purity prevails. But the work needs to be done. So in other words, by hook or by crook. So the crooked ones are recruited to do the job just as much as the righteous ones. You see? But they act as this delivery man. See? He delivers. He brings the parcel. He does the job. He might be shining like a shining being, like a deva, and encounter with him is unforgettable. Or he might be this coming out of the van, you know, all tattooed. You know, it's like, lady, you have a delivery here. Can you sign it? And you don't really want to come close to him, you know, because it's like really, it's dangerous. But he delivered. He's done his job. See, so this is our day and age. This is our day and age. There are a lot of teachers who actually do their job. And they may be son of a guns of a highest order, you know, in many, many moral departments, but we don't live in time when we can complain. And we better not complain because we need to understand. And we all still want to have good papa, good mama, you know. We want to have our, everything is good in our life. Everything has to be proper. Listen to Tupac Shakur then. No? That's will tell you about mama and papa. It's all there. Life kind of situation, measured by direct experience. In the day and age we live in, <clears throat> the propensity and the danger is, is that we like to carry our uh, wounds as medals on our chest. We like to carry this 
because it's incorporated in our personality and it kind of like makes us feel proud of being crooked by being hard done by life, by circumstances, you see, it somehow adds that, you know, <clears throat> that chip on the shoulder. I, I secretly know I'll be better off, but no, that makes me special, you know. I get into the, <clears throat> like, to reckon with. This is, in Tantra, would not pass. You see, the first step is the last step. Nobody crooked anyone here. Absolutely, absolutely none of that. Everyone is a shining from the start, from get going till the very last breath. This is the understanding we need to wake up with and go to sleep with. And then let the traumas be healed, lick them like a wolf and hole on the moon. Lick that wound and hole to the moon. But don't start biting the pack because you, you've been mistreated. Or, the, or listen to the Deep Purple song, Mistreated. That's, you know, with the, covered with, the, you know, James Rowan Deer or the cover, you know, Coverdale. That's the song. You know the song, Mistreated? <clears throat> you don't know the song, Mistreated? Tomorrow, the, the outside speakers, we're going to listen, Mistreated. Is the heaviest kind of like where hard rock before it broke into heavy metal, equipped with very heavy blues influences, you know? Oh man, it's so good. It's like it's making song about being mistreated into an anthem. True anthem. See? Richie Blackmore left the purple and formed his band Rainbow. And people still argue to this day is the fans which performance was better by David Coverdale or James um, the, uh, the, uh, the yeah which one do you prefer? Yeah, Dio is the greatest singer, isn't it? Like he's like he's like a, he's as great as Freddie Mercury in terms of the vocal capacity. But no, people don't know him. Everyone knows Freddie Mercury. But the depth of the sound, right? And the guy was small. He was tiny. Five foot. He was like a kid. Sorry. Yeah. Stay on track. So... Another perspective now. Okay, so this is the third perspective, the hidden perspective. <clears throat> and it's not like, please don't just for a moment, like I'm just not saying that to you because you know that. For a moment that I'm trying to embellish, embellish some of the gangs who mis misuse their position. The way someone will made up, oh yeah, of course he will, he'll be talking. That I ended up in forums being spoken in the same breath as the rapists, murderers, and child abusers I lived through. My wife was the only person who can really stood up to that in her own blog. Go and read about that. So I have nothing to lose. My reputation is completely got kaputed by people who were licking my feet, metaphorically, but nearly literally. So when I speak about this, I don't speak about it from some kind of hypothetical. No, I speak about it from direct experience and I don't give a toss. Or I don't give a blip. So, there is something else as well. One of the aspects of today entering these shoes, doing this job, Unless one cowardly plays, I'm not a guru, I'm not a teacher, I'm nothing, I'm just a messenger, you know, I just throw it at you and I run away, because this is a cowardly position. Because one still amazes followers, and followers just as much fall in love secretly, but they cannot express it. It's just the hypocrisy. And many teachers playing this hypocrisy because it's a safe card, it's a safe number. Because today, to be a teacher, 
so many projections are immediately upon you. So many projections. And the first and foremost is to waiting till you make one singlest, littlest wrong move so as to pedestalize you and break that statue like the, you know, because this is, this is the fun. This is the most fun is to, you know, and you, yeah, you know, like that's what gives the joy to the mob. You see, because this is like pitchforks and let's kill the Shrek. <clears throat> but this is something else is going on there. And that something else is to be considered. Unfortunately, in our day and age also, when things are perplexed, very often those who are put in a position such as being the delivery man, they are also to deliver the karma. And this is not something that they took it up on themselves. They act, act by doing this, doing this so-called ethically despicable things coming from a place of tremendous settling of accounts and affairs. But nobody understands this to the degree to which to speak about it openly. We can speak clean cut like Sadhguru does, sounding so like, like know it all. It's like so nice that we can talk about the Prarabdha, Sanchita, you know, Agama Karma, we can talk about Rnanubandanas, we can like, but there is something factual. If there is a force flowing through your veins, through your, if there is an amount of Shakti, everyone you encounter, you will deliver so much karma there and then for their own good. And some of that would be nasty because that meant to be delivered that way. No other way it will be delivered. You see? It's a rehabilitation of the Judas job. It's a rehabilitation of the Judas job that only Martin Scorsese as a young man tried to do. It's literally the most hated character, right? Cast out like completely. He's worse than, you know. In Dante's Alighieri, he is down in the lake Cassid because he's the betrayer of the teacher, of the son of God. <clears throat> but what if he delivers the karma there? I'm just reversing. He's not the teacher. Rabbi is the, Rabbi is the teacher. But there is the way certain things need to be delivered. And many, many, those who somehow placed in the shoes inadvertently, inadvertently, very often they don't even know how that happens. Not because it's a lack of so-called ethical considerations and what have you. There's something else is at play there. But the territory is so, so, uh, how do we put it? There are, there are areas which we cannot even speak openly. See? We immediately uh, run the risk of really offending this community, that community, this set of moral conduct, you know? After, like, no. See, this is, this, is where, this is where somehow these Oriental teachings started to come in very often from these hidden pockets, areas, into the mainstream of the Western culture, into the mainstream. See? So, of course, then we end up with teachers like Swami Muktananda, Chogyam Trungpa, who leaves the trailblaze of so-called misdeeds, you know? court cases and this and that, and like people's heads stand on that, not just on their heads, you know, everywhere. The head just stands completely, one becomes like a, you know. But, you know, can you produce talk like this and put it out? Can you speak, can we speak about this? And this is a, that third very important consideration. If we are to understand this from the monistic perspective, but if all that bounces off the wall somehow of our, forgive me, sense of 
being wrong done and sense of righteousness, then yes, of course, going down to the level of he did that, she did that, he said the like, yes, there's a continuous and constant misdeeds. I mean, <laughs> there is a Facebook called Roots of TM. You read about that. It's like, <laughs> it's like all those who were glorifying Maharishi, dicing him now left, right, and center, like completely, completely. Those who were like, whose name are only known to us because of their associations one way or another with Maharishi. Because it's his turn now. He can't speak for himself. So everyone is there just like, you know, how can it be? How can it be? This is why when spiritual teachings were unfolded and taught in tighter, insulating communities, right? In more of that, like order-like, which, of course, today immediately will be called cults, right? Because it's a very, very convenient term, a cult. And the cult is, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of like an immediate, almost uh, a reflex. Anything that I don't understand, anything that like, just share a picture on Facebook, everyone wears light clothes, you're cult. You're wearing the same clothes, you must be cult. You see? Nobody says that when you see pictures of denim and people are wearing all nice denim, that they're cult. I have seen pictures like that, plenty. When everyone was smoking Marlboro, like cult of Marlboro smokers. What about the cult of Pepsi-Cola drinkers, Coca-Cola drinkers? Hmm? What about that? So this, this, uh, Painful, uneasy questions, but looking into this sincerely, and this is something, if this is something that is pertinent to your own sense of well-being and evolution, and I, I hope you can clearly see here what it, what it is. You see, because very important to understand how easy everything can be eclipsed of what it was, what is what. You see? The value of what and how our mind immediately plays with everything. Our mind is capable of cancelling 99, let's say, percent of good. If we suddenly saw 1% of something which is somehow giving us this moral superiority, superiority uh, hook, because this is what we are. We, we like to have this, oh, wow, uh, uh, mm -hmm. see? So it's a messy, messy business, and messy it is. What is it, what really comes? What is the result of it? What is the outcome? That's what's important. See, so here now is another proverb. Proof, proof of the pudding is in the eating, not in the pudding itself. Like in America, very often I hear people say this proverb in the wrong way. They shorten it and they say, the proof is in the pudding. No, sorry, proof is in the eating. Not in the pudding. <laughs> you were just saying it wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I've heard that many times. Also, even on TV, on TV, it's like, no, proof of the pudding is in the eating. And that's, that's what really is it all about, you see? Very easy. It's very easy. If I'll go and stay in enough time on Roots of TM on that Facebook, it will start to dent my feelings, you see? Yeah, because it's like nasty stuff. You have to also, in a way, and this is also, of course, um, 
shouldn't be black and white because this we know the value and the importance of being able to discriminate, discriminate, to see clearly, question, discriminate. But once that process is behind us, once we commit to something, we commit to the principle. What we worship is principle. What we devoted to is principle. It supersedes the person. It supersedes the container. The container is a mortal device which will perish. It's gone. You see? This cup will be broken, destroyed, but it served the drink. It's quenched the thirst. A good beverage was poured through it and offered. You see? So we want perfection in the wrong place. We want perfection from our masters. You see? We want perfection from our teachers. And day, of, day one, you may even remember, whenever I went... I always said, my first teachers all drank rum and all sorts of stuff that burns. You like, Shh. it burns. <laughs> no. My first mentor, who, who was a martial artist, brilliant painter, you know, he drank like a crazy. My first teacher in art college, who was a brilliant painter, extraordinary painter, always smelled, always came late. He never was in the morning, ever. He would come, show up about, like, I don't know, after lunch, smelling like a, like a whole tavern, you know? And yet receiving instructions from him, for me, was the most precious thing. 15-year-old skinny kid standing there listening to this, like taking every word. Maybe because I was grew up there where this has value. You see, I didn't stand from him like, you know, no, I, I suffered that. It was unpleasant, you know, but to me, it was not important. You see, I will dare to tell you, I even loved him as for everything he was, because when I grew up, became like, I've realized what a precious gift it, it, it was. And. Our teachers are imperfect in our age, in our day and age. And what they go through, we have no idea, you know? So what it was like for this teacher to be there and sharing these jewels, this precious stuff, he wasn't telling me like, no, everything that was said was trampolining me in that evolu evolution of let's say, acquiring that, what's so important in that age, you know, so it's extraordinary. Nothing short of ordinary. No, he wasn't at all this kind of like, no. Very, very human, very, very, very smelly. <laughs> what do you make of have you heard, did you, I mean, you read in Play of Consciousness and, and a part of that is a story of a, a saint that Muktananda comes across who leads him to Nityananda, who's, you know, basically like a crazy homeless person who's sitting in rubbish, but smells like a rose. It's a Priyana. Yeah, of course. When that higher, con when consciousness is that high, that, you, that nothing... Not even a speck of dirt sticks to your body. What then is that that the karma is all burned away? You know, how is that how is that operating in this respect? We could say that accumulation of karma is impossible. That's what's important. But karma that belongs to the karma at birth continues. So its accumulation of karma is finished. But you cannot burn the karma that yet to come. See? You burn the seeds. That's why some sages of the highest caliber 
who were actual true saints, like someone like someone like Swami Lakshmanju, whose conduct was in that sense impeccable. But look at his life. Look how difficult his life was. He was born, unlike most of the gurus who became emperors and became illustrious and mega wealthy. He was actually born into a wealthy family. He used to throw banquets where 2,000 people were fed in Kashmir. He housed and hosted Maharishi Mahesh Yogi with his students in the ashram entirely for free. See? As an honor. And yet he had to flee Kashmir. That another saintly example of the family of John and Denise Hughes that brought him to Los Angeles because the civil war there in Kashmir was at its highest at the time. And there were, it's so much unrest and his, his life was simply in danger. So, you know, and he, he just now kind of gained that post-mortem recognition. But during his life, lifetime, none of that. None of that. In fact, you know, like we could see that he was born into it all and left it all behind, living in Los Angeles in someone's house. And of course, they, do, they did everything to make his life comfortable. But just think for a moment. Just think for a moment, you know? It's like, and then asks to be taken back because he feels his days are nearing to Kashmir, no matter what, because he wants to leave his body in a place where he was born. See? So the karma can be very, very difficult, depends on what to be experienced. And in something else is there as well. Those who start teaching and enter interaction of the direct transmission are always accumulate more karma, not because they accumulate for themselves, but because they need to now, they need to now be in a position to help to resolve a lot of stuff that happens around them. And that does not make things easy. There would have to be somewhere consciousness stretched here so it will be either physiologically very demanding and their physiology will suffer, as all the physiologists of the most fa famous um, Mahatmas and beings were not very well known. All of them suffered severe cases of diabetes. All of them, from Ramakrishna to Ananda Maimar to Maharishi Mahesh Yogi to Muktananda, right? Like the physiology really took great toll. So, I don't know where else we want to go with that, but let, let us not have some kind of like rosy perspective on all this, because they, it's not rosy. It's really helpful to have this conversation just to kind of air it out a little bit. You know, but the, the only other... Point I wanted to touch on that I was curious about was the kind of I don't know if it has to do with you know physiology or bio just the way Shakti expresses through your body you know your propensity to have certain characteristics and I you know aside from karma and kind of the how you're a messenger and kind of coming back to being unapologetic about who you are. Um, may, maybe I could just ask, like, do you feel like your expression has become more, uh, you know, if we're working with a, an idea that, 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 that you are the full expression, do you feel like you've become more of something that, that is in you as you have gained greater awareness. Does that make sense? If, if, if I'm following you fully, if I'm following you fully, 
Because for someone else, it might be different. The, the full expression may be something very different. All right, so this, <laughs> we, now, but we kind of like now we're, this is anyway, loose canon conversations. So we already gone, like, like, so might as well carry on in that spirit. We're like trying to now make sense will be almost inconsistent with where, where, where we're. So what I'm going to say is going to start sound, may sound just, uh, could be misunderstood at the very least, right? It may sound a bit preposterous and or wacky, but let me make it very clear. I always knew who I am, always, always. There's no memory in me that I can reach that I did not know who I am. It just was secret. It was a something that was not meant to be fully acknowledged. See? But even as a kid, as whatever, I knew always who I am. It was very clear, transparently clear. And of course, this was like, like let's say, this <coughs> interactions even that I had. I always had this interaction because I was also in a very, very uh, physically weak body as well as a kid. I was born with the defect in the heart, the hole between the two. Um, stomachs of the heart so there was a swish and until the age of five there was like talks about mm, he's gonna make it now and then so it was like a no-no for physical exercises or like really like a you know pale skinny something until I met my mentor when my mother took me to my mentor at the age of 11 and said he's smoking pot I cannot do it you know I'm a single mother please and immediately, it's like I entered in the world of, you know, a very different rea reality. See? But despite of that, it, it was irrelevant to me. And I always had this great respect among the kids anywhere. Like my close companions know that even in the kindergarten, I had a nickname, Commander. <laughs> Ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah, Commander. That was my nickname. And this is how I was like, coming. In. But you see that every, everywhere. You, you see the kids. You work with kids. You see anyone work with kids and see how there's constantly someone taking a lead. Girls, boys, like this girl gets up and goes there, the whole swarm of them. Let's do this. And everyone does it. Well, stop doing that. Let's go there. Let's eat ants. And everyone eats ants, you know. Let's climb the tree, you know. that that's that. It's all done there. So to me, it was always clear, always clear who I was. And everything else was a play and game. But of course, at a certain point, this morph into this, like, kind of begins to... So when, let's say, that transformation of consciousness took place, this is what I meant when a few nights ago, when I was speaking about it, that <clears throat> one of the most commonly shared feature is that when we recognize our essence, it is immediately accompanied by the sense of, I have always been that. Remember when we talked about it? So it's not like, wow, I became someone, or I became something greater than I was, or no, this is what I meant, void is behind. I came out of the void and I thought, this is my nature. I've always been that, that vastness, that infinity, always, and suddenly I like, that's what awakening is. Suddenly, just wow. So this has always been there. And of course, whenever I tried to speak about it, I had to tame it down because as a new kid on the block, I came in, do I say that right? From get going, 
mm, not sure if that's the case, you see. But in the interviews that I gave, if one is attentive enough, one will detect that. One will hear that there. So when you're asking me, have I become, right, a full expression of what I have considered myself prior to that? No. I haven't, be I haven't become anything more than I am. Nothing that was added onto me, no became greater, no became more significant or less significant. There's nothing. And this whole thing is, this whole thing is just as bizarre, fascinating, quirky for me as you probably perceive it each in, in your own way. You see? Sometimes I laugh at myself. Sometimes I make myself like, what a pain in the butt you are. You know? Because it's like, oh, you know, like you knew that you met these people. Oh, I'd love you to give me a crash course on how to fold fabrics and your clothes because everything you do is like, you know, even your suitcase looks like as if it's a kind of like a Japanese work of art. Yes, yes but some people may think this is a, some kind of like obsessive, you know, whatever, what is it called? O, OCD, you know? So I'm here praising myself for thinking how well organized I am, but it's actually an onset of something. <laughs> <laughs> We're all on the spectrum now. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, it's like this all this fullness is this. Fullness, this completeness, it's extraordinary and also contradictory because there's nothing more I love than this. This friendly banter, this sharing, enjoying, reflecting. <clears throat> and yet, my most favorite passing of time is to be alone, completely. Alone from my kids, from my loved, be beloved wife, alone. Nothing else is more precious. So which one do I like more? I don't know. See? So, thank you for these questions and my encouragement to you will be to just simply, simply rise above all this. Rise and see it for what it is. We don't have time to dwell on, you know, how things could have been and what. Let me say just one more thing to throw it out <clears throat> into the open as a potential something perhaps to return. This dynamic between the teacher or the perceptor and the one who temporarily assumes whatever role of a student, disciple, or some simply came for clarification, always, always a reflection of parental affairs. Whether we want it or not, or always, it's a reflection of parental affairs, which in turn, parental affairs is a reflection of a cosmic order. If you study astrology closely enough, attentively enough, after a certain, let's say, introductory level, you will go, whether this is zodiac-based or whether this is Vedic-based, you will encounter this, what stands and spoken of as the archetypes, just like the sun stands for father figure. Sun in your horoscope stands for the father figure, the position of the sun. You see? So, teacher of all kinds, when particularly when it comes to the matters of spiritual domain is a reflection of the relationship we had with our parents and it will begin to play itself out in whichever way it cannot be otherwise because it's not that it's a reflection of your parents no it's a ref it's a reflection of the universal arrangement 
of how things are. You see? This is very important to understand. Very important to understand because this in turn frees us from unnecessary blind spots and projections and makes this connection into a really what it is. It also creates the possibility for that what works beyond any domain of the language exchanges because that's in many perennial traditions simply spoken of as heart-to-heart -heart transmission. Heart-to-heart -heart transmission is not based on conversation and understanding. No, it's not based on that. Do you love your mother or father because you had conversations with them? I hope not. It's a bonus. It may, in your memory, stay, well, that was such a great time, you know. Oh, this is... No. No. The bond is something else, completely. And this is what plays itself out. These are the dynamics. And so many, unfortunately, seekers fall prey to this, and it's why we keep seeing this like falling over only to hate, you see? Like these extremes, being completely boiled over, completely like enamored, and then doing everything to de, de what is it? Pedestalize. Because then we have the real reason and this we look for these reasons and then you know knocking off this is like a now i feel satisfied but something else is playing itself completely out completely something else and it is this needs to be known this is because it's a universal affair universal affair this is it's not for no reason in Christianity, in some religions, like, you know, like all these ideas of God, Father, or the Great Mother, you know, that Great Ma. Why is it Ma? Why is it not Great Auntie, for example? Well, why, why not? And why God is not a good uncle? A good old uncle, he was the one who really was cool. But it's just, you know, so, and that's where the process of reparenting begins. Reparenting. You see? So the psychological maturity is inseparable from reparenting ourselves. So this is to reflect on. Thank you. Thank you.